Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. Over the years, Latin America has seen more than its share of coups, dictators, autocrats, and stolen elections. Well-functioning democracies, free and fair elections, independent media, strong and independent institutions, active civil society have been, and unfortunately still seem to be, the exceptions rather than the rule in too many countries in the region. Why? Why hasn't liberal democracy developed deeper roots in Latin America? Why are institutions under pressure in so many places? And why is corruption, political corruption, too common throughout the region? My guest today knows Latin America as well as anyone. Brian Winter is a journalist and the editor of America's Quarterly, which is easily doing the best and broadest reporting and analyzing of all things Latin America. Welcome, Brian. Alan, that's a generous introduction. I'm happy to be here and it's good to be talking with you. Let me start with the big picture. According to polls, less than half of Latins support democracy. A third of people in the region say they're largely indifferent between a democratic regime and an authoritarian one. Dissatisfaction with democracy, depending who you talk to, is through the roof. Why is liberal democracy so difficult for so many people in so many countries in Latin America? Well, it's a good question. And as you said in your introduction, a lot has changed over the last 40 years or so. As a matter of fact, if you go back to 1977, which is the year that I was born, there were only four true democracies in Latin America. And then in the 1980s and early 1990s, we saw a actually a, a democratization wave unlike really any other seen elsewhere in the world. And by the mid-90s, there was only one dictatorship which of course was Cuba. But the story then started to take another turn, uh, cyclical perhaps, uh, in the 2000s. We've seen countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua fall off the map. And as you referenced, Alan, we've seen other countries where democracy has come under great stress um, or has deteriorated to the point where they could really be called more hybrid models. And today, I think it's safe to say, as we sit here in 2021, the future of democracy in Latin America is very uncertain. As far as your question about the reasons why, I think, you know, for one, it's important to acknowledge that there are big variations within the region. This is a region of more than 500 million people, several dozen countries, and and the story differs from one to the other. But generally speaking, I think this is a story that mirrors a lot of what's happening throughout the West. Um, Faith in institutions and in rules and in systems is in many cases being supplanted by faith in a powerful leader um, who, you know, predictably decries the system as being run by corrupt elites that are out to get you. So there, of course, is more to the story, but in kind of the broadest brush strokes, I think that what we're seeing in the region is really just a reflection of, of what we're seeing elsewhere in the world, including to some degree here in the United States. Let's stay with the polls for a second. One of the, for me, weird bits of polling results I've seen recently is that as you look at weak support for democracy, it is weakest among the young and strongest among the old. And the latter, I understand, because they experienced those horrible times back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, They recovered from uh, dictators and and in some cases, some very nasty Argentine, Brazil, Chile situations. But I'm stunned that the millennials and younger seem, if not indifferent to democracy, not enthusiastic about democracy. Is that a fair statement in, in your experience? That's fair. You know, that's a fair rendering of what I've seen in polls of what I have heard in conversations with people in uh, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and also, again, the United States. As far as why, I think 
you know, and I, I to get a little bit philosophical here, Alan, I think that we are hardwired as human beings to follow a strong leader. There's something within us that attracts us to a leader who you know wants to take us in a very confident direction. And you know, we've learned, especially in the 20th century, how destructive that can be. And so you have these older generations who have the memory of that. In the case of Chile, Argentina, Brazil, these were regimes that were in control in the 1970s and 80s. But as the younger generations come along, they don't have that experience. They didn't live through it firsthand. And so I think those lessons become forgotten. And I I think that's a big part of where we are. The question for me is whether these younger generations will have to learn those lessons all over again, or if the center can somehow hold. I could quote the poem, the center rarely does hold, at least in the poem. Um, but we have, to, we, have to, we have to parse the why, I think. And economics is undoubtedly part of the problem. Uh, Latin American economies have not performed particularly well since the end of the commodity super cycle. Of the 26 most unequal countries in the world, 15 are in Latin America. Uh, Too many people are barely surviving in too many countries, and COVID obviously made all of that worse. Uh, May well be that voting for a populist or voting for a strongman, there would be air quotes on that, could actually be a rational response under those circumstances. If democracy isn't delivering the social contract, maybe you try some. Maybe it's rational to try something else. I hate the, well, I hate the possibility. Yeah, and and this is where we get. You know, we've been talking about the West more generally so far, and and here's where we can get into the specific story of what's happening in Latin America and where it's somewhat unique. As you know, the 2000s in particular was actually a time of broad-based prosperity in Latin America because of the commodities boom, which you've already referenced. Um, You had more than 50 million people rise out of poverty and join the middle class, which became the biggest demographic in Latin America um, for the first time ever. And of course, again, this progress was very uneven across countries. Um, Most of the progress was seen in Brazil uh, and on the country of South America's Pacific coast, um, which benefited particularly from uh, rising exports of goods like copper, iron ore, um, soy, and so on to China. And this was, again, this was a period that saw a a considerable amount of optimism. Uh, Support for democracy actually rose because people were happy. But then when the commodities boom ended and some of the... um, less than business friendly policies that had been rolled out during that period started to take their toll, um, the fortunes turned and people not only saw their lives, their lives stop improving, but millions of people actually ended up passing from middle class back into poverty. And that was traumatic um, and easy to understand for people who had actually had some expendable income for the first time and had lived through an extended period of their lives where they were able to afford not only enough food to put on the table, but basic consumer goods like washing machines and televisions and refrigerators and other things for the first time. Um, You know, it's one thing to have always been poor. And it's another thing to have actually acquired a certain station in life and then lose it. So there was, you know, there was this phenomenon of people lashing out. And in the process of lashing out, Um, they looked at the politicians who were in charge and said, uh, you know what, maybe it's not just one or two, maybe it's the whole system. And it created an environment where leaders like Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro or Mexico's Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador were able to come in and say things like, only I can fix this. Which, of course, is a phenomenon. Again, I mean, that's we've we've heard that elsewhere. We've heard that elsewhere. Um, That is something that, you know, a certain U.S. president also said. And um, so that's that's kind of how we we got here. It's not clear to me whether those kind of more authoritarian minded or at the very least anti-institutional figures are going to win the day or not, because there are signs of a backlash uh, in places like Brazil. Um, and, you know, I, I still have some belief that a more democratic spirit 
may prevail, but it's going to be close. It's going to be close. I think that what we're seeing now is this, we, we get this kind of slate of elections all over the region. I think a lot of is going to depend on the timing of these elections because recovery is underway right now in most of these countries. And we, where there was an election uh, two months ago in Peru where a very anti-establishment, uh, arguably authoritarian figure, Pedro Castillo, um, he won. But as we look ahead to elections in Chile uh, later this year, and then Colombia and Brazil in 2022, the mood may have improved enough by then where voters may be less less eager to sort of lash out at the system as they vote. And so I, I think the more time passes from the pandemic, and especially if people are able to start feeling this recovery, we may see democracy still hold firm in a lot in some of these places. Let me push back on that a little bit and separate the process from the people, because certainly in a number of cases, I'm thinking the recent Argentine elections, I'm thinking the Chilean candidates that seem to be emerging. Uh, the, the system, if not the center, is holding, uh, but you're beginning to see uh, extreme possibilities, both left and right, pop up um, that are, are, whether they're strong men or women, um, they seem to be saying these, the way the societies are organized is not delivering. Yes, there's recovery. It's very uneven. It's the, the social inequality, the, the economic inequality in Latin America is dramatically, it's always been bad. It's dramatically worse than it was. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if, yes, democracy holds, but increasingly you get weird right and left candidates offering weird solutions. Well, this is where it may be helpful for us to delve into some country specifics and, and stop talking about Latin America as a whole, which is, you know, I think useful, but only up until a point. Let's talk about Chile. They just had a series of primary elections in which the communist mayor of one of the areas of Santiago, the capital, a guy named Daniel Hadwe, who had been leading nationally in polls and admittedly a very fragmented field, actually lost the primary to a significantly younger and I believe more moderate, relatively speaking, and democratic figure, um, Gabriel Boric, uh, who is a 35-year-old former um, student leader and uh, congressman. And that was shocking to me because Hadway seemed like the runaway favorite in that race. And it was a case of the Chilean left favoring a candidate on the left. Uh, and he is a leftist. Don't, you know, no, no mistake about it. Um, and uh, he has been very... Uh, strident in his condemnations of leftist dictatorships in Venezuela and Nicaragua. He has talked about things like fiscal responsibility. Um, and he was also one of the people who was key to brokering the terms under which Chile's constitution would be rewritten, in which two thirds of the constituent assembly would have to approve the final document, which many people, including myself, believe was the decisive, will prove to be the decisive moment in Chile's constitutional process because it means it, it basically lessens the likelihood of radical change. To cite another example, um, in Colombia, uh, Gustavo Petro, a very radical figure from the left, um, is still leading in polls for their elections in the middle of 2022. Um, but his support has, you know, has flagged somewhat over the last couple months, uh, in part because it seems that this radically anti-establishment mood um, may be calming down a little bit in Colombia following the protests that we saw uh, in late 2020 and again now in 2021. You mentioned, Alan, you know, these these candidates on left and right who are offering, let's say, untraditional proposals. And I think Boric would definitely fall 
the Chilean would definitely fall into that category. But there's something to be said for generational change too. I mean, I, I, and I'm sure you'd agree that anybody who comes along just promising more of the status quo is not going to win an election in 2021 or 22. I think now is an opportunity um, for people to imagine policies that can correct this massive uh, inequality that we see in so many Latin American countries, while also preserving democracy and capitalism. And for that to happen, uh, it may take some creativity. And, you know, we'll see. It's still early in the Chilean case. I mean, Boric may prove to be more out there than it seems, but at least on the early returns, some of these figures are less disruptive than we might have expected six months ago. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. Let's um, talk about Brazil. You have a rich history in the country. You've lived there. You've reported from there, on there. You know, you know Brazil. How worried are you that Bolsonaro, if he loses, will go quietly into the night? Does he have that speed or not? I was amazed when he said recently, I'm either going to be reelected, arrested, or dead after these elections. That is what he said. And I believe that there is a crisis ahead in Brazil uh, for that very reason. Um, The fundamental truth of Brazil is this. Uh, Bolsonaro is less popular than he ever has been. Uh, He does retain the support of maybe 25 to 30 percent of Brazilians in polls, and it's an enthusiastic support from them. They turned out in the hundreds of thousands uh, for a demonstration in his favor recently on September 7th. But all the credible polls show Bolsonaro not only losing, but losing badly to virtually any candidate um, in 2022. The election is next October. And the front runner to defeat Bolsonaro is the former Brazilian president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who, of course, uh, governed Brazil on the left uh, from 2003 to 2010. I do not see a scenario under which Bolsonaro would agree to hand power to Lula. And that's kind of the fundamental truth that's driving this crisis right now. Bolsonaro is trying to follow the Trump playbook uh, and build on it, uh, correcting, quote unquote, uh, everything I'm about to say here is in air quotes. Yep. <laughs> he's, yep. he's, he, Bolsonaro is looking to correct the mistakes that were made by Trump in 2020, meaning um, putting people in key positions like the defense ministry and hopefully elsewhere who would break his way um, in the event of an election loss uh, in the way that that people like Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell did not break in Trump's favor uh, back in 2020. And so I, for me, I see, you know, really two potential scenarios for Brazil in 2022. One is that Bolsonaro wins the election, uh, which I don't think can be ruled out uh, for this very reason of, you know, the potential for economic recovery and falling unemployment. And, and, you know, given the pace at which the 2020s have moved so far, Alan, God knows what is in store for the rest of this decade. Anything could happen. Um, but if Bolsonaro loses, uh, I think he will lash out and refuse to leave. Um, and that's not me being paranoid or anti-Bolsonaro or hysterical or any of these other things that I am sometimes accused of being. That's just me listening to Bolsonaro's own words. He has said this. He has said that he will not go anywhere um, and that he, you know, he, w- he will only um, leave the presidential palace by force. Uh, He's also said that he will stop obeying certain Supreme Court rulings that he disagrees with. So what all this sets up is, you know, kind of a showdown among Brazil's various institutions. Um, All of them are involved. Uh, Brazil's a big country, as you know. It's one where power tends to be diffuse. And there are many different institutions that all kind of compete with each other for primacy and power. 
from the military to the Supreme Court to Congress to the business establishment and private sector and so on. It's hard for me to imagine a scenario in which Bolsonaro prevails, but it all depends on how things go. I mean, what the actual circumstances are, whether it breaks in a way that Bolsonaro is able to craft a credible narrative in which he is the one defending democracy. And that could happen. So I, I think it's going to be a very unpredictable story. And it's going to, it's one that is likely to last for the next 13 months because this election is still more than a year away. That does allow us to talk about the military in Latin America, because the military is clearly one of those institutions in Brazil uh, that could have something to do with the outcome. But at the same time, um, much to my amazement in Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has been using the military not for defense purposes, but they become his, one of his biggest contractors. Um, in Venezuela, obviously, the military is a terribly important force that has kept um, the people who are in power, in power for some time, et cetera, et cetera. Is the military back a as a credible political force in the region or is each case sui generis? Oh, there's no question that the military is back as political power brokers in much of Latin America. And, you know, we at America's Quarterly, we don't have a crystal ball, but at the beginning of January 2020, we put a bunch of soldiers on the cover and the headline was back in the spotlight. And the whole point of that issue was to say, uh, these guys are back um, as not, not in charge. Uh, they're not rolling tanks to the, through the streets and leading coups in the way that they did uh, back in the 20th century, thank God. Um, but they are for a variety of reasons, and some of them tend to be different from country to country. They are certainly back in their positions as power brokers in civilian politics. Um, as to the question of why, I think that going back to you know kind of earlier in our conversation, Alan, I think old habits die hard. And these are countries where the military traditionally held power. I think that there is, and I have conversations with people in senior ranks of militaries, a few um, throughout the region. And I think that there's a general realization that times have changed. I don't think that we will see, um, you know, an overt military dictatorship uh, in the way and style that we used to see back in the 20th century. But, you know, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Peru, and a couple other countries, these people, these generals, still see themselves as the quote-unquote moderating power, as the people who are there as the guardians of the long-term interest. And, you know, the story of how they found themselves back in this position is largely one of uh, elimination. <laughs> I mean, the truth is um, the military was distant from power during this period of redemocratization that I referenced uh, in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s because of the disgrace that many of them lived through uh, because of the human rights abuses and economic dysfunction that defined the military dictatorships of the late 20th century. And then uh, that magic thing, time passed and people forgot. And the old stories about the military being uh, supposedly less corrupt than civilian politicians, which is really, there's no evidence to suggest that was ever true, but it's a persistent myth uh, in Latin American, well, in politics uh, in many parts of the world, including Latin America. Um, you know, people started to look to them again as custodians of good governance, as potential guarantors of security, uh, certainly the case in Mexico. And one of the most unusual cases of this, as you've mentioned, Alan, is, is Lopez Obrador, who, you know, certainly uh, comes at this from an ideological space that does not traditionally turn to the military as partners in government. But for Lopez Obrador, it was a way to essentially meet a human resources need reach beyond the private sector, so much of which he seems to detest, um, and the traditional powers that be of the, the PRI and the PAN, which he, he says are, you know, the kind of the old Mexican parties, which are all the same, and find people who were untrammeled and had a somewhat clean reputation. So I think this is another cyclical question. Uh, 
we will see over the next couple of years, scandals start to emerge where we remind people that actually the military is not so clean after all, but it might take some time. You said earlier that it's always dangerous to talk too much about the region as a whole because the countries are so different in many ways. But one of the things that has surprised me, continues to surprise me, in fact, is that the mess in Venezuela, the political, social, military mess, hasn't had, doesn't seem to have had more of an impact on other countries. And I, I'm not talking about the migrants. I'm talking about, here's a dictator who was originally elected to office, eventually transfers power to a bus driver who's now the president of the country, um, clearly incompetent, can't govern. And the rest of Latin America just seems to look the other way. It, it doesn't seem to have an impact, but is that, is that wrong? Oh, I disagree. As someone you know who spent the early 2010s living in Brazil, I think that the example of you know the failure of Chavez and then Maduro in Venezuela has been the most effective publicity possible against a certain kind of leftist socialist thought. Um, to a degree, actually, that I think is sometimes unfair, meaning, you know, the Chavez Maduro boogeyman has been a very effective campaign tool to the extent that it's, it's been very hard for any candidate in uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, um, other countries, any candidate that sort of smells of um, of Maduro has had a hard time, at least. There are, of course, cases where leaders sympathetic to uh, Maduro, such as Evo Morales in Bolivia, uh, have been able to uh, be elected. But they usually have kind of success stories that are independent from or that precede uh, the disaster in Venezuela. So, so no, I, I, I think that you, you could even argue that, that the failure in Venezuela has prevented some even more moderate leftist democratic governments uh, from coming to power uh, in places like Brazil, just because that example has seared itself into the imaginations, the kind of the popular imaginations of people all over the region. Let's spend our last few minutes talking about foreigners and the impact of foreigners, in particular China and then the United States. So China has a growing footprint in the region. It's the usual economic investment uh, through the private sector. Does that have any implications for democracy and for democratic institutions, or is it entirely economics? That is a great question, Alan, and I, I wish I had a clean answer to it because it's something that I think all of us are trying to figure out. There's no question that we are emerging into a more bipolar world, I, I believe. Um, there's also no question that Latin American countries are facing pressure to take one side or the other, even though it is the last thing that most governments want to do, regardless, by the way, of whether they're left, center, or right. I know because of conversations that I have that even conservative leaders, you know, aligned with the United States in many respects, stay up at night worrying that in some way, shape, or form, they will be forced to choose between Washington and Beijing, to choose between the country that they culturally identify more with and the country that in most cases is their biggest trading partner, sometimes by a very large margin. Remembering, of course, also that we're coming out of this, not only this difficult pandemic that destroyed economies in 2020, but a decade of stagnation. And so they're very reluctant to alienate anyone right now. As a matter of fact, we, we've been publishing a series of articles about this very question on the America's Quarterly site over the last couple of months. And it has been not exactly surprising, but interesting to see for me time and again, how even some of these thinkers on the center right and right are saying, look, we can't 
choose. I mean, one recent example, we published a piece by um, Felipe Larraín, the former Chilean finance minister during the government of Sebastián Piñera, who is on the right. And Larraín says, um, it is not in our interest to choose. We do not want to choose. Now, your question was whether this expanding relationship with China, assuming that it continues, um, whether that will directly contribute to this further erosion of democracy. And I I don't know. Um, people in Washington certainly say it will. There's no doubt that the Chinese model itself is profoundly authoritarian and uh, among other, um, you know, anti-democratic adjectives that you could pop in there. Um, but you know, whether it actually contributes to the erosion of democracy in the region or not, I'm not sure. I, it gets into theoretical questions that I'm not sure we have much evidence on. Let's take a specific case again. Um, the United States has been pressuring the president of Nayib Bukele, um, the president of El Salvador, um, because he has been engaged in a clear offensive against El Salvador is very delicate uh, and often flawed institutions. Uh, Bukele has retorted um, that, well, uh, he hasn't said this uh, verbatim, but his message essentially amounts to, well, maybe I'm going to go work with China instead. Does that mean that China's presence is eroding democratic norms? You could make a case that it is just by providing an alternative that is uh, at the very least values neutral. Um, but of course, the U.S. has its own history of propping up more authoritarian regimes and not caring about things like democracy as long as countries play ball on issues like uh, immigration and drug interdiction. So I, I, this, this question of, of China's presence and whether it directly contributes to an anti-democratic trend or not, I, I think it's, it's, at least for me, it's too early to definitively say. And there is the Venezuelan case. The Chinese support for Venezuela has been critical to the survival, at least at the level they survive at, of, of, of this regime. That's but, true. I mean, they, the question is, were they an enabler of a regime that had already kind of zeroed out all its democratic qualities, uh, or did they directly contribute to that slide? The last question is the United States. Um, clearly, and you referenced... Uh, the last, the, the most recent American president, um, impact of Trump and in, um, in Brazil. We are where we are. It's 2021. Uh, we have Trump in the rearview mirror. We have Kabul in the rearview mirror. We have lots of things going on. Um, and again, generalization is uh, a bad thing. But I'm going to ask you to generalize. Is the U.S. viewed as a positive force when it comes to democracy and democratic institutions in the region, neutral, irrelevant, or what? That's a complex question, Alan. Look, I, I think the United States is still viewed as the world's oldest democracy, as a country whose institutions were pushed to their absolute limit during uh, late 2020 and early 2021 but still came out of it and pulled off a democratic transition, something that maybe other countries under similar circumstances wouldn't have been able to do. But I do think that the credibility of the United States when it comes to you know, being seen as lecturing other countries about their own democracies has clearly been diminished. I think that there is a considerable amount of eye rolling now when the United States um, directs its uh, you know, disapproval towards these countries like El Salvador, where democratic backsliding is real. Um, maybe 20 years ago, uh, getting that kind of warning from the United States would provoke a, uh, at the very least, a, a, a profound amount of political soul searching and debate in the capitals of these countries when those warnings were made. And today, I think it gets greeted with just a kind of a shrug and people look at each other and say, who are they? Who are they to be telling us um, what democracy should look like? Um, I think that there's also, generally speaking, I think amongst uh, particularly the, the political and economic establishments in capitals across the region, 
I think that people are rooting for the U.S. I think that uh, at the very least, they're rooting for our democracy to go back to kind of a position of strength uh, where these populist forces are less present in part because these, um, you know, these elites realize that what happens here tends to have ripple effects in their own countries. Uh, of course, Bolsonaro and Brazil being sort of the most obvious, but not the only example of a leader who was openly emulating Trump and continues to do so. So, you know, a lot has changed over the last two years in terms of how the world sees the United States, in terms of how the Latin America views the quality of U.S. democracy. I do think that the erosion that we've had in the United States has had a ripple effect, has contributed to the erosion in Latin America. And it's another reason to, you know, to, to hope that things improve in, in months to come, not because, you know, I, I personally favor a Democratic Republic or, or Republican uh, administration, but just because I root for democracy. I think it's the best system that we've come up with and, you know, human civilization to resolve our differences. And I hope that we don't have to go through kind of a long, dark night in order to realize its importance again. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for this conversation. I want to end with another kudo. But I said at the beginning, I want to repeat I think the work you've been doing at the America's Quarterly over the last couple of years uh, is phenomenal. It really has become a must read in a region where there's very few things that try to cover the whole region, which has always been part of the problem for those of us trying to have to think about the whole region. America's Quarterly uh, is fabulous. Alan, thank you for your kind words. Uh, it's 20 years of following the region for me. Uh, I'm originally from, from Texas, but started my adventures in Argentina more than 20 years ago. And it's a region I care about a lot. Uh, and it's always interesting. <laughs> and I, I hope that, you know, another period of good years are ahead. We can only hope. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. Mm-hmm.